Hello and welcome everyone to the fifth session of the DuraCloud Brown Bag series. My name is Carissa Smith and I am the partner specialist primarily working on the DuraCloud project, which is both a managed service and an open source technology offered by the DuraSpace organization. To find out more about either DuraCloud or DuraSpace, I encourage you to visit their respective websites located at duracloud.org and duraspace.org. Please note that your audio for today's call is disabled, as you've probably already gathered, but I highly encourage participation through the chat feature located in the bottom right of your screen. And as a matter of fact, that is the, the whole purpose of today's session. Um, we'll get started now. Um, I don't really have a theme of today's session. I won't be doing any live demonstrations. I wanted to open up uh, this July session to the audience members for any open questions regarding uh, DuraCloud, uh, the managed service, the open source software, pricing and subscription plans, the cloud in general, digital preservation, uh, really anything is fair game. Um, I might not be the best person to answer the question, but I certainly will, will take any of the questions and will follow up later if I don't have an answer for folks. And if it is all quiet, I have prepared some uh, frequently asked questions as well. So there will be a session today, but I'd like to make it as interactive as I possibly can. So uh, feel free to start typing in your questions re related to DuraCloud or the cloud in general in the chat feature, which should be at the right hand side of your screen. And if I don't see one come in right off the bat, I'll probably start with a, a user submitted question that came through after um, last month's session. Um, I do see someone is typing, so I'll wait for, for just a moment to see if the question comes through. Um, and again, I would encourage everybody who is signing in to uh, insert your questions through the chat feature on the right hand side. That's really my goal today is to get any unanswered DuraCloud questions um, answered for you. All right, so we have our first question. Uh, Jim Brewer asks, just this week I looked at the DuraCloud website. The facts are dated 2011 and there is mention that PDFs are not searchable, but interested parties should contact you. Can you tell me about PDFs and any changes? Uh, yes, the facts are very <laughs> sorely out of date and it has been on my place to update them, uh, Jim, so I'm sorry about that. Um, if you mean searchable within DuraCloud itself, um, right now we don't have any search capabilities uh, within PDFs or within the content that you store within DuraCloud. Um, that is actually on the roadmap for the, I believe, the next release. If not, it's the following release. So it should be available this fall. Um, that would be searching content within DuraCloud. So searching on, on content name and on some of the data properties that are associated with DuraCloud uh, within the web interface. Um, I don't believe it will be searching within the content of PDFs or other types of documents. Um, that'll, that'll probably be a, a secondary phase of our, of our search capability. Um, but that is on the roadmap, on the, the immediate roadmap for integration with, like I said, the next DuraCloud release or the, the one uh, right thereafter. So it should be ready for the fall. Um, if you meant search in some other, in, in some other way, let me know. Uh, just clarify in the chat, but I hope, I hope that's what you were, what you were asking. Uh, and thank you all for questions. This is fantastic. Uh, Joanne asks, we're a university archive in need of a hosted streaming video solution. We're looking at Brightcove and DuraSpace. Could you comment about DuraCloud's options and also anything you might uh, offer about comparisons with Brightcove services? Well, I have to say I'm not particularly familiar with Brightcove, especially from a technical perspective. So um, I can't really do much in the way of comparison, but I'll, I will fill you in with details about DuraCloud's media streaming capabilities. Um, so DuraCloud can um, certainly store any type of content file within DuraCloud itself. Um, and we do have a media streaming, both audio and video streaming uh, service within DuraCloud. It's very easy to start um, to stream your videos uh, within the DuraCloud interface itself or we do give you the ability to then embed those media streams into your own applications. Um, there is a, there's a streaming service URL that you would simply embed. Um, and we do provide ancillary um, files for creating playlists or, or kind of sub-collections of your audio and video files. Um, we do have a, a limited capability in terms of the file formats that our streaming service will actually um, integrate with. Um, I think the most popular MP3, MP4, FLV files uh, can be streamed 
um, but it is a relatively short list, and I can get you the the actual um, file formats, Joanne. I just I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, our streaming service integrates or leverages the Amazon uh, Media Streaming CloudFront uh, capability. So we are leveraging a an Amazon service to provide streaming within DuraCloud. Um, regarding how you would then embed those uh, video or audio files into your own applications, I, I have a, a special recording um, of a brown bag I did that shows how you would go about doing that. Um, so I will send the link uh, for reference for that if you if that's of interest. Um, let's see what else should I make mention of the media uh, media streaming within DuraCloud um, from a cost perspective. Um, first, you would pay for the storage of your media files within DuraCloud. That's currently how our subscription plans work. You sign up to store, you know, X amount of content um, for, you know, whatever length of time, a year, two years, etc. Um, but from a media access perspective, we would then charge uh, an additional um, amount of uh, amount for the content that you're streaming out of DuraCloud. So um, you'd you would pay to store one terabyte of audio video files. And included within is, excuse me, included within that is a terabyte of streaming, um, within that the the set price for storing one terabyte. But if you had an access use case where you assumed that your video and audio files were going to actually uh, be streaming about three terabytes uh, on a yearly basis, for instance, they were highly accessed, a highly accessed collection, um, we would work with you to estimate. Uh, you know exactly how much you would be streaming in a year, and then charge you for the additional, you know, two terabytes of streaming, etc. Um, that's really the only charge that is not included in the DuraCloud subscription plans, um, which I can talk about in in more detail if people have questions. Um, the streaming capability, because it's really hard for us to estimate uh, streaming and access on uh, mini media and media, excuse me, audio and video files, um, but all the rest of the storage and additional services and even the use of the media streaming service are built into the subscription plan itself. Um, <clears throat> I see Joanne has a follow-up and then I'll touch base on the other questions that people uh, have asked. I just don't want to go back and forth. Um, Joanne had a follow-on. Are streaming files or whatever they are generated from stored preservation files in DuraSpace? Oh, that's a really great question, Joanne. And currently the answer to that is no. We don't have any media transformation, translation um, services available. Um, we would uh, assume that the customer would be uploading uh, access files if you wanted to provide media access to your content and separate preservation files um, for your audio and, and video files if you had both available. But we don't have any uh, service where you would upload your preservation file and then we would um, <clears throat> typically probably uh, make it much smaller into a media, uh, an access media file. And then one follow on Joanne to that is do you have any client examples of streaming from DuraCloud? Um, I think the the best example I can give you is we did um, a couple pilot runs with WGBH Boston, which is a PBS affiliate uh, within Boston. They streamed one of their collections um, and I'm, I can't remember which one it was. It might have been the Vietnam Vietnam uh, collection that they had uh, through DuraCloud. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough funding to become a DuraCloud customer, but they were success successfully able to stream content from DuraCloud that was um, embedded in their own uh, web uh, web collection. So, you know, their their customers or clients or users weren't going to DuraCloud; they were streaming uh, directly from uh, DuraCloud. Uh, no, it's not online at WGBH. Um, unfortunately, since they're not a customer, they're not. <laughs> they wouldn't be paying the bill to stream those out of DuraCloud. Um, but, however, my streaming from DuraCloud example, I believe, is still online. Um, let me answer a couple of these other questions, and then if we have a couple minutes here at the end of the session, I will poke around and see if I can find my. I have a collection of dog videos dancing and singing and howling um, that I embedded in a website and I should be able to pull that up for you I believe so let me look for that let me backtrack here I had a couple other questions come in uh, Liz asks are people using DuraCloud for both access and preservation uh, that's a good question Liz let me go through my my brain here and go through our customer list and see if there's anybody using them for both you certainly 
let me backtrack a moment, you certainly can use DuraCloud for both access and preservation. Uh, within DuraCloud itself, for those of you who aren't familiar, there are um, things called spaces. Essentially, it is a similar to a file folder or a content container. And at that level, you can set permissions uh, of the content that's stored in that space or that container. So uh, some spaces can be used only for preservation. They could be um, completely dark so that only an administrator would have access to content within that space. Um, and then obviously on other spaces you can set the access um, so that they're light or open and publicly accessible so that the content within um, a couple different spaces would be available to the public or you could use to embed uh, in your own applications. So you certainly can use DuraCloud for both access and preservation. Um, one of our um, one of our current customers is using DuraCloud, I think, for kind of a hybrid of, of access preservation. They're a very small institution, and they have um, a couple other partner institutions that uh, have not signed on as DuraCloud customers, but they wish to share their DuraCloud account uh, with those other uh, partner institutions. So what they're doing is creating uh, a couple a couple separate sets of spaces for their partner institutions, uh, giving them, the partner institutions, that's what I mean by them, uh, the ability to access those spaces but not see the spaces of other partner institutions. Um, so that's, I guess, that's kind of access and preservation. Uh, those partner institutions can choose to do what they wish uh, with the content that's held within, that, the, within those spaces, um, whether it's pr preservation or for access uh, purposes. And um, one other related content item, I guess, to, to your question, Liz, is that you can run services on a space-by-space -space basis as well. So, for instance, if you're interested in streaming media um, from one space, but not streaming media that's stored in your preservation space, for instance, you put all your preservation videos in your preservation space and you put your access videos in an access video space, um, you can run just the media streaming service over your access content and then completely have your preservation uh, audio and video files closed during a dark in a dark space so that administrators would only have access so they they remain untouched and then all of your access files could be uh, located in a separate space that was then uh, lit up for the public or embedded in your own applications. All right, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, for anybody who's joined the session since we first got started, feel free to start uh, inserting your questions in the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it is an open question and answer session, so I'll do my best to get to everybody's questions today. And if it does go all quiet in the next 45 minutes, I have some prepared questions as well. Um, so Jim said, let me get this down so I can read it. We have an interest in business continuity, i.e. be able to recover from a crash and fail over to another system. I realize that DuraCloud is not designed for this, but do you have any plans along those lines for the future? That's a good question, Jim. Um, you can certainly you can certainly recover your content from DuraCloud. I mean, as as a backup system, uh, we do have a uh, a utility in place called the Retrieval Tool that will allow you to pull down, um, as I mentioned before, just a space of content or all of your content within DuraCloud um, to recover from a, a system crash, deletion, failure. Um, you can certainly store uh, system files within DuraCloud. So if you have, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of the, the correct terms, any, any sorts of system files or configuration files, uh, DuraCloud is file uh, file agnostic, file format agnostic, so you can store really anything, uh, you know, server images, etc., within DuraCloud, and then restore uh, restore from those just by retrieving them back down to your local machine. Um, it hasn't really been a priority or a focus just because we haven't heard it from customers uh, to be more of a system kind of fail failover. You can't you can't run any additional applications within a DuraCloud space. Um, at this point. Um, it is an open source project so you could certainly write your own services uh, if you wanted to, but we haven't heard a lot of, of need or interest from our, our user base as, as a system failover. But um, I would certainly be interested to hear if you had any more ideas uh, along those lines because um, really one of, my, one of my roles as a partner specialist is to relay uh, customer needs and desires back to the development team that we then discuss and then decide when and where to implement within DuraCloud. 
So if you have any more information about um, exactly what you what you would how you would foresee DuraCloud working in a, in a system failover type um, such scenario, that would be very helpful. Okay, let's see. I think I answered all of Joanne's questions that were next on the docket. And then let's see. We've got another one down here at the bottom. Uh, has DuraCloud completed its beta testing cycle? I was aware of beta testing going on with participants and do not recall if that was concluded. Yes, we ran two full complete pilot uh, beta testing phases. Um, I think the first of which started two and a half or three years ago and then we had a second um, more complete pilot testing phase. Now I'm asking, now I'm trying to remember when. Um, I believe a year and a half, a year and a half to two years ago with 10 partner institutions. Um, and we launched DuraCloud to the public and I, I, I guess at that point was a, we're officially out of the beta testing phase last fall. Um, so yes, we, we no longer have any, any beta testing going on of, of the DuraCloud service that you can sign up for at this point. We did run a, uh, a small pilot relating to uh, video and audio preservation within DuraCloud, and this might be of interest to you too, uh, Joanne. Um, and again, that was last fall. Um, and we had a couple um, partner institutions, again, uh, uploading uh, their preservation and access files within DuraCloud, um, both video and audio. Um, and then we did a lot of discussions around what types of service services in addition to the media streaming would be of interest to folks with um, both audio and video collections. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of consensus around uh, standards as well as um, file formats. So what is the standard preservation format for a video file? And because there wasn't really a lot of consensus, there was certainly a lot of discussion, as there always is, but not much consensus over uh, video preservation and file formats. Um, any of the services that we had contemplated, such as uh, video transformation or translation services, um, weren't really, weren't really uh, on the docket just because we had no idea what types of video files would be coming into DuraCloud that would need uh, transformation. Um, okay, so the next question, just want I read over your question again, Jim, just to make sure I covered everything. Um, and I think I think a couple of participants are still uh, trickling in. So for folks who are just dialing in, feel free to insert any of your questions in the chat feature today. Um, my goal is to get all of your unanswered questions uh, out in the air and, and hopefully answered by myself. If not, I can follow up later on um, for folks. Um, so again, any questions related to DuraCloud or the cloud or digital preservation are fair game. Um, Joanne asks uh, an additional follow-up question. Could you suggest the most efficient route for us to set up a trial of DuraCloud for streaming media? What level account to set up, whether free or not, duration, etc.? Sounds like trial accounts take a while to set up. If we do the subscription with first month free, can we cancel if we don't want to continue? Actually, Joanne, I would say the, the easiest way for you to trial DuraCloud is our 60-day free trial. Um, essentially, all you need to do is email me when you want to get started um, or fill out the, there's a trial account form right on the, the DuraCloud.org website. Um, you can access it, I think, by our Try It link right on the main uh, site at DuraCloud.org. That sends an email to me and, and then I'll follow up with you. Um, essentially, how the DuraCloud trial accounts work is that as soon as somebody submits one of those trial account forms, I contact you. Um, I typically like to schedule a demonstration session um, with you and your team members if you have them uh, working with you, just to kind of give you a, a quick overview of DuraCloud and the, the web application itself and, and talk a little bit about your use case uh, specifically, whether it's preservation access, access etc. And then you have 60 days or um, sometimes a little bit more than 60 days to trial DuraCloud and at that point you can certainly uh, walk away or not. The trial accounts are actually uh, production sized quality DuraCloud accounts. It's not like you have any limitations with the DuraCloud trials. Um, you have access to all the services. Um, the only limitation on a trial account is that we ask that you um, only upload about 500 gigabyte uh, during your two month free period. Um, perhaps for your media use case we could bump up that limit to a terabyte for the two months uh, if you have a lot of video files that you want to uh, you want to test with. Um, but again, at the end of the 60 days, you are under no obligation to continue using DuraCloud if it doesn't work for you. Um, so just, like I said, fill out the form or, or shoot me an email. 
and uh, I can get that started for you. Um, Jim asks a follow-on question. Could you give, an, uh, give us an approximate idea of how long it takes to load a client's uh, data? Let's say we have one terabyte of data that we would like to upload. How do customers schedule this? What about how long that would take? That is another, <laughs> another great question, Jim, and, and one that's difficult for me to answer um, because it is typically limited to or based on your, uh, your bandwidth and your network connection at your location. So you can upload content to DuraCloud in, in one of three ways, but each of those ways is contingent upon your connection, your internet connection, and your bandwidth. Um, you can certainly upload content through the DuraCloud web interface. Um, and again, this is just all through the, uh, um, a browser window within, within, uh, on your computer through the internet. Um, the second way is through the DuraCloud synchronization utility. This is a command line tool that is free of charge that you would download to your local machine. And essentially you point it at some local content and it will chug away uploading that content to DuraCloud. And then the third way is through the DuraCloud REST APIs. Um, these are typically uh, more attractive to programmers who like to create their own scripts or integrate their own applications to upload content to DuraCloud. Um, but again, all three of those ways of adding content to DuraCloud, the REST APIs, the uh, synchronization utility, and the web, uh, web interface tool, the upload tool, all um, are contingent upon your bandwidth, your connection. Um, loading a, a terabyte for me um, takes, is it roughly 24 hours-ish? or a little bit more. Um, I'm on just a, a re regular residential uh, bandwidth capabilities, um, but probably at an institution, uh, you probably could leverage a little bit bigger pipe and connection um, that you could then uh, use to upload content to DuraCloud. I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer to your question, but again, it really, it really does um, rest on your internet connection and how quickly it would take to upload content uh, to DuraCloud. The, the nice thing with the synchronization utility is that it will chug along in the background on your machine uploading content for you so you don't have to babysit it or manually add content to DuraCloud. You can just point it at a, a local um, file directory and it will upload content um, <clears throat> in the background while you, while you do other things or you can certainly run the synchronization utility on a, on a network server uh, as well. Um, I hope I've answered all the, the bits of that question. If there are any uh, follow-on questions based on uh, what I just said, let me know. Um, Liz asks, what kind of data preparation can users expect to do locally and what will DuraCloud handle? Basically, what type of data wrangling or metadata preparation is a user required to do? Um, another great question, everyone. Please keep them coming. Um, there isn't really any data or metadata preparation necessary when uploading content to DuraCloud. Um, the three ways that I just mentioned in terms of how you would add content to, content to DuraCloud um, just allow you to essentially navigate to your local, your local uh, content store and upload content as is. Um, as I mentioned before, DuraCloud is file type agnostic, so you can upload any types of files whatsoever. Um, you don't have any uh, pre-preparation necessary, uh, as I know some um, some storage providers require, such as you know Bagit systems, etc. Um, DuraCloud takes content uh, as as you have it locally, so Word docs, PDFs, images, audio, video files. Um, we even store uh, zip files, tar files, AIP archival information packages within DuraCloud. Um, Again, you know, the sky's the limits in terms of the content you can store, and you have no no uh, need to prepackage uh, any of that. Regarding metadata, um, that's a little bit different uh, story within DuraCloud. Um, DuraCloud itself is pretty much pure storage, um, so you can store metadata files, you know, as XML or any other type of file format that you have your metadata in. Um, however, it doesn't function as I think you would expect metadata to function within a repository environment. So your metadata file won't be explicitly tied to uh, the content item or the content items of a collection uh, as you might expect it would be in a, in a repository. Um, 
from a preservation standpoint, DuroCloud will certainly preserve all of your content items as well as those metadata files and do integrity checking on each of those um, to ensure that your content is not changing uh, within the cloud. But there's really no way to, um, to connect or create a relationship between uh, individual metadata files that you would upload into DuroCloud and the, the content that that metadata is describing um, at this point. That's not to say in the future that DuraCloud couldn't, um, couldn't have a, a tighter relationship between metadata files and content items. Um, it has come up on occasion from customers, but we haven't really gotten a lot of feedback in terms of how they would expect that to work in the cloud. Um, just because DuraCloud itself really isn't a repository and is not meant to be a repository replacement. So from, from a preservation angle, how would you expect uh, as you as a, as a customer, as a user of DuraCloud, how would you expect how um, that to work within the cloud? What would the interaction be for you, the user? Um, so Liz has a follow-on question, uh, I guess not related to the one I just answered. Uh, so how is access provided when DuraCloud is used for access? Um, in a couple different ways, Liz, it depends really on your use case. Um, at, the, at the very core of DuraCloud, uh, when you upload content items into DuraCloud, each of them has a unique storage URL associated with that content item. Um, and I can, I can sh show this later on, but again, it's a unique URL uh, for each individual content item when you, when you store it in DuraCloud. And then based on the space that that cont content item is located in, um, it has certain permissions. Um, you can turn space access to the content items stored within the space either on or off meaning um, it's open to the public or it's closed in a dark archive. If a content item is in an open, publicly available space, those storage URLs um, are open to the public. So if someone explicitly knows that storage URL, they can access that content item. Or probably more importantly, you can use that storage URL to embed in your own applications. So essentially serve that content from DuraCloud. If, on the other hand, your content items are stored in a closed space, meaning that uh, a user, a person, would have to log into DuraCloud to actually see the content. If someone were to try to access that storage URL, which still exists for a content item, they would be presented with a DuraCloud login screen. So they would have to uh, be forced to enter their DuraCloud credentials. And um, if you had embedded that storage URL in your own applications, and then the content item is held within a closed space, it certainly wouldn't be served up unless you have um, programmed your application to kind of pass in the DuraCloud credentials to serve out that image. Um, that's another possibility. But um, again, so directly from the DuraCloud interface, um, there we have that level of DuraCloud login uh, based on your credentials and user, user credentials. And then um, depending on what your use case is, if you have embedded those um, content URLs within your own applications, again, uh, the content would have either have to be in an open space or you would have had to program your application to pass in the, pr the appropriate credentials to DuraCloud before it will actually serve uh, that content item to your application. Um, let's see, Joanne has a, f uh, a question about does DuraCloud have uh, as clients any content DM repositories linking to stored media files in DuraCloud? Uh, good question. And the answer to that is we did during the trial, um, one of our clients did do a content DM backup to DuraCloud. Um, I, I believe it was just a pure backup for preservation or backup and restore purposes. Um, I don't believe they did any trialing of linking um, DuraCloud media files back into content DM. Um, but I don't foresee why that would be a difficult thing to do as uh, DuraCloud provides streaming URLs, et cetera, that you could very easily embed into a content DM or a DSpace, et cetera. Um, trying to think of any other uh, technical ramifications or integration uh, pieces. From my limited technical knowledge, I don't think it would be overly difficult, Joanne, to, to do that. I just don't have a, an example of anybody doing that that I know of right now. Uh, Jim asks, we've listened to a presentation from James Hilton about Deepin. 
and he talks about partnering with other services. Is that on DuraCloud's list of things to discuss with outside entities? Does that even make sense? Um, that's a that's another good question, Jim. I keep saying that for everyone. Everyone's questions are amazing. Keep them coming. Um, DuraCloud is being considered as part of the AP Trust, which, again, an acronym. I'm not quite. I think it's the Atlantic Preservation Trust, which is going to be a node of the Deepin network. Um, so DuraCloud, at this point, I believe, uh, will be used as a node within the Deepin uh, network and it will be located uh, at the APT at the APT node which right now is being led by the University of Virginia. Um, I believe their technical stack will include DuraCloud and Fedora um, but I'm not quite sure I'm not I'm not part of that project I'm just on the on the periphery um, I know they are uh, looking into DuraCloud and to the best of my knowledge yes DuraCloud uh, and uh, several other DSpace or excuse me DuraSpace technologies are being considered uh, within the Deepin uh, infrastructure. Um, and that is a, a priority for the DuraSpace organization to have some, if not all, of our, our technologies where appropriate being part of the various nodes of that Deepin infrastructure. Um, and then, let's see, Joanne asks, how can we, i.e. my boss, <laughs> see DuraCloud in action? Active client sites providing public web access to their DuraCloud content. We have a list of um, <clears throat> testimonials on DuraCloud.org, but we actually don't leak off to any live DuraCloud serving websites um, at the moment. Um, like I mentioned, I do have a sample one that you could certainly <clears throat> show your boss as an example, um, but I don't believe we have any active client sites uh, that I'm aware of that I can point to. Let me just go through my little brain here and think if there are any. Um, to be honest, the more common use case within DuraCloud at this point is for preservation. Um, although we have had people trialing access, I'm trying to think if we have anybody using it as, as uh, currently embedding uh, DuraCloud content within their applications. And I, I believe the answer is no. I don't think I can, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's anything available at this particular moment um, but I will follow up with you, uh, Joanne. I'll send you an email um, if I have any good examples that come to mind after today's session. But right now, I don't believe we do, other than my my sample. Uh, Rick Johnson, uh, clarified Academic Preservation Trust. Thank you. I'm terrible with acronyms. And he said, yes, I believe the plan is to leverage DuraCloud and Fedora. Great, thank you for <laughs> thank you for the follow up, Rick. As I mentioned, I'm just on the periphery of of that project, um, but I know DuraSpace is an active partner. Um, I believe I've answered all the questions that have come in so far. I see there's a few more participants who have snuck in uh, as we've been going today. Um, feel free to insert your questions uh, if you have any about DuraCloud or any uh, preservation or digital content related questions. Of course, anything is fair game, and I'll do my best to either answer them or refer back to um, to folks who know more than I do after the session and follow up with you folks. Um, I did have a user submitted question uh, at the end of last uh, month's uh, session that I wanted to discuss today. Let me move my slide ahead. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, um, so we should have plenty of time to go over this. And if anybody has any additional questions, I will uh, answer those. Um, so one of the quick audience submitted questions from last from last uh, month's session was the importance of file naming conventions, uh, particularly in digital asset management of audiovisual materials. Um, and I have to admit that I know very little uh, about best practices uh, for file naming conventions, so I phoned friends within the DuraSpace organization, colleagues who knew more than I did, and uh, based on all the feedback I received, it seemed like there were uh, potentially two approaches to file naming conventions. One being uh, deliberate, deliberate and thoughtful, um, being deliberate and thoughtful about naming uh, your files, not only for future migration pur purposes, but also for uh, probably content identification as well as technical identification. Um, a secondary approach that came up quite often, um, and this was particularly from the folks 
my colleagues who were uh, librarians, and they automatically admitted that up front, that they had a probably a particular bias, was regarding um, really focusing on the preservation metadata uh, for content items. So not really focusing on necessarily the file name, but the metadata format, as well as the, the metadata that was included within those uh, audiovisual materials, particularly around uh, the origin of that file, um, I think both from a location, but also uh, what type of uh, technology was used to capture uh, the audio video material. Um, technical codex, I know this is specifically um, of interest for vi uh, video files because they both have audio and video codex or could have multiple uh, streams within one video file. Um, technical specs, etc. Um, so the secondary approach seemed to be uh, lady, uh, excuse me, seem to be using uh, preservation metadata to really load all of the information within uh, for an audiovisual material within the metadata versus the file name. Um, I did want to point to a couple different resources um, regarding this question. Uh, the first, um, after doing some Googling and some reading, was from our colleagues at the State of North Carolina Archive and Library. Um, on the, at the URL listed on the screen in front of you, they have a really nice uh, file naming convention best practices document. Um, this was more towards government uh, documents and files, etc., not really so much for audiovisual materials, but it does a good job of covering a lot of the um, a lot of the topics that might come up uh, with file naming conventions and what they've what they've decided on within the state of North Carolina um, to. to determine how the best practices for naming their files. And then the second resource on the slide was actually um, a part of our, our the Duraspace organization's last hot topic series all about audiovisual materials. Um, we had one webinar specifically on uh, the best practices of describing audio video files uh, with metadata. Um, and there are uh, a couple um, real scholars uh, on, on that who, uh, well, scholars and consultants who, who do this on a day-to-day -day basis who have certainly more knowledge on this than I do. Um, so the recording to that session is on the screen in front of you. And again, um, they focused really on the metadata, um, both from a technical perspective uh, as well as um, just metadata in general used for both um, audio and video files and what best practices are uh, there. So. That's really all I have about file naming conventions. If folks in the audience have uh, other thoughts or best practices that uh, that you you typically follow at your institution, I would um, I would heartily encourage uh, any feedback on that. Um, let me see if any other questions have come in through the system. I don't think so. Um, I will do one last shout out for questions here in the last seven minutes of today's session. I don't want to go over as I like to keep this in with, within the lunch hour for most of you, hopefully. Um, again, I had a couple of prepared questions, but since we're since I had plenty of user submitted questions, I don't have to go over those. Um, I will, as always, do my plug for free DuraCloud trial accounts. As I've mentioned, they are free for 60 days, though if you have a particularly hairy use case, we can certainly broaden that out. Um, again, it's just a conversation with me, and I, and I do my best to try to meet your needs so that you can do a thorough evaluation of DuraCloud at your institution. Um, simply go to duracloud.org and click Try It, or um, you don't even have to do that. You can just send me an email. My email is in the second bullet on the screen. Um, the next DuraCloud webinar will take place uh, August 29th, brown bag session, excuse me. And um, I'm hoping the topic will be ways DuraCloud can help you. I would certainly appreciate feedback if you have any about uh, open questions that you may still have or thoughts about how DuraCloud could potentially be used at your university, but you're not, not quite sure. Um, I would certainly be willing to cover that during this session. And of course, all of the information about these brown bag series, as well as recordings of each and every session is available on the duracloud.org website slash brown bag series. Um, I appreciate all of the fantastic questions that came in today, uh, as well as your time. I knew, I, I assumed uh, this, today's session in the month of July was going to be um, pretty quiet, but I, I was very much impressed by all the great questions today, so I certainly appreciate it, and I hope it was of value to everyone who participated. 
Um, as always, if you have additional questions uh, later on in the day, feel free to email them my way. And with that, I will say good afternoon or morning if you're on the West Coast to everybody who dialed in today. And again, thank you for your participation. It's always great to have folks dialing in.